there. Uh, my name is Mikael Roman. I am the coordinator of the uh, UNEC Transformative Innovation Network. Very much welcome all of you to our first episode of the live podcast Innovation Circle. Uh, it's actually more symbolic having this conversation than I thought because on my way here, I actually realized that it's one year on the day since we launched ETI. And lots of things have happened since then. Uh, won't go into it, but we're trying to always evolve. And uh, we thought that one piece was missing, and that was the, the direct interaction with our members on a continuous basis. It's always so easy. You make the 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 um, the uh, events, and then after a while, you kind of drop. You make all the efforts, but we want a continuous contact, and we also want um, moments for reflection and so forth. So we this we talked about, and we said we need a space for more in, informal conversations, where we also bring up. Um, the different aspects of, of transformative innovation that we not necessarily think about. And um, they could be perhaps more practical uh, than conceptual sometimes, but they should also be personal and, ref and, and the space for, for reflection. Uh, we also want them to be agile in the sense of being both intellectually agile, I guess, but also being able to, to do them on the spot. And in doing so, we saw that as a perfect complement to what we also already have, which is the the um, the ongoing um, podcast, the Innovation Matters, with that Anders uh, Jensen is um, is pursuing had pursued for for years. Lots of, of concrete impact or or, or, or in, input, but uh, where the interaction is not uh, is not there for obvious reasons. So uh, this is what we want, an informal space for this discussion and conversations mm -hmm. and uh, uh, where you will have as guests will have the opportunity to interact and pose questions to our guests and where we also want um, you to be part occasionally the moderators. So um, what we are thinking is to have this pod live podcast every second week on Wednesdays at uh, four o'clock. Uh, and uh, like I said, moderating guests and moderators, picking up on topics that are that are out there. So please input on, on those. Uh, we will make them kind of semi-exclusive semi for members in the sense that only members can participate in, in this event uh, and being interactive. Uh, then we will put them on the, on the site on the website for for um, uh, two two weeks afterwards, but that's pretty much how we proceed. I won't take too much time and shouldn't because we have much to talk about. And um, uh, but let me, as a framing, perhaps say that when we started the the, the transformative innovation network, we landed obviously in the word. There are two words here: transformative and innovation. And as we always do, we kind of end, end up in this innovation. What is the, innov this is the innovation part? And I think it is the, the, the rocket fetish in all of us. We like technology. We like to talk about you know, technology and stuff. But what is it actually a transformation? That might be uh, perhaps something that we overlook sometimes. We need to talk about what a transformation really is in order for us to understand how the, uh, the, the innovation is going to support it. So with that said, we thought of it, um, Manuela, Olivia, and I, and thought, what is it that we want to, shouldn't we start off with actually discuss, discussing what a transformation is? And it so happens that uh, Bjornula Linnér, which is an old colleague and friend of mine from Sweden, actually wrote a book on that, uh, and they, uh, about sustainability transformations, where they come from, etc. And I read it and I put it in hands of, of Manuela and she said, this is a great book. We should talk to Bjornula. And I said, yeah, why don't we talk to him together? So that's why we're here. And I would say then that um, Manuela, please, you you do the, you converse with Bjornula and <laughs> take over from me. So. Thank you very much, Mikael. And uh, also good, yeah, good afternoon from, from me. Thank you so much for joining, um, specifically in this in this first episode of the live, um, live podcast under Etin. 
And maybe before we, we go in and uh, I have the pleasure of introducing my, my guest speaker, I just wanted to say a few words about the structure of how we envisage this, this live interaction to go about. So I'll start off um, asking Vionola a few questions. Um, and then the second half of the hour, you will have the opportunity to you know, raise your hand and also ask questions um, to him directly and further in the spirit of you know, this live element of, of the podcast that we're trying to achieve. So um, yeah, please feel free also to, to add any questions in the chat um, and colleagues and I will, will look through them and, and um, pose them towards, towards the end. But uh, without further ado, um, we'll dive right into today's podcast, and I am very honored to welcome guest speaker Bjorn Ola Linne, who is a, a professor for environmental change at Linköping University. I could forget my pronunciation. Oh, <laughs> I'm trying. But who's also a visiting fellow at the at the Center for Environmental Studies at uh, Geneva Graduate Institute. So. Welcome, Jan Willa. It's great, great to have you. <laughs> uh, maybe before we begin with the with the discussion of the book, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your research focus, what interests you, and perhaps you know what what brings you to us uh, in Geneva. What are you focusing on now? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. It, it's great. To, it's a great place to be, Geneva. You, as you know, uh, the Graduate Institute where where I'm um, I'm based. They focus on international relations and development studies and, and uh, are very renowned for that. It's been a long, for, for a long time in my field. So that is a uh, very privilege to be there. And as you know, Geneva is a hub for international organizations. So if you're interested in uh, global environmental governance and the geopolitics of sustainability, they, this is truly a fantastic place to be. So uh, that's what brought me here. And because my research then is on, on global environmental governance. And more and more focused than in international governance is on transformation. The, the headline of the 23rd agenda is transforming our worlds. And then we can see increasingly how international organizations and countries and companies and so on are engaging with this concept mm -hmm. worldwide. So it's will be fun to talk about that. <laughs> Excellent. I mean, we we in Geneva are very happy to have you here, even if it's for a short time. And uh, what, what you mentioned provides a perfect segue into, into what we're discussing today. So before we go into more specific questions about the content and the concepts that you mentioned, perhaps you could say a few words about, you know, why did you write this book? What what was your inspiration um, to write it? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, because that brings it to why we, we my co-author, Victoria Wiebeck and I, it had this specific take on the uh, in the book, which I will talk about, because I was involved in uh, international funding calls and review processes, both in the European Union, but also in international um, the funding agencies and so on. So these collaboration agencies that, that you have for, for the different national uh, funders and so on, are involved in several calls on societal transformation. And, and what struck me there was that, that there are so many, many takes on this. People make sense of this concept in so many different ways uh, that we needed to sort of map all this sense making. How do people engage? What, what does it mean for different people? Because evidently it means a lot of different things at that stage. Mm -hmm. I think there has been some conceptual clarity since that, but that was my, my entry point because I thought a lot of these projects that got funding for, for transformative mm -hmm. research was just more of the same that mm -hmm. they already done. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of disappointment. So and as said many times, when you start from a disappointment or a failure, but when you, that, that, only ways up. <laughs> yeah, so starts your creativity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my colleague is a communication researcher, so that's why we focus on seeing how how the the concept is engaged with around the world, not only policy documents, uh, but also when it comes to media and uh, we also had focus groups in in five different countries and in the five continents. To see how, how does people engage with the concepts, you know, with because sense making is really much not only about trying to understand it rational, but it's in our conversations and we talk about issues that 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 we can get a grip on how people engage with the concept. No, absolutely. I mean, as 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 Mikhail also alluded to in the beginning, you know, when we were beginning and we were building this network, we were you know introducing it as the transformative innovation network. But one of the first questions that we were always discussing with those who we spoke to is what does transform, transformative innovation in this case, but what does the transformative mm -hmm. part of it imply, you know? Because mm -hmm. there's also other words such as disruptive, radical, you know, how 
in what relation does it stand? How does it fit into all the other concepts that we use? So that's why it's it's very interesting, specifically for our work, to see you know exactly how you go further into the different definitions, the sense making part of it, and and we're very excited for those who um, who have not seen it yet. I'm also holding it up. I'm not quite sure if it's available, if it's that visible for our colleagues online. But it's called sustainability transformations, agents and drivers across societies. Um, we're happy to to share um, the link of it um, after after the podcast. Um, yeah, so maybe you know, as um, catching on to what what you mentioned last. So you start off the book talking about sense making, but also about the definition of of transformation, right? So um, my first question would be, could you could you elaborate a little bit on on the on the meaning of transformation? How does this stand towards the meaning of transition and what does this imply for you know our ambitions our actions yeah i think that's a great starting point because what we can see in the policy literature that the, the concept of transition transformation is often used synony synonymously so mm -hmm. that interchangeably but increasingly also policy documents but and in research there is made a distinction between these two concepts which I think is, is is very enlightening. Going back to the roots of the con concept, right? Because transition means like going from one state to another, whereas transformation is, is a new form of, of society. I think that, that can be an important distinction. So you could imagine that that we have a go from a, a fossil fuel based energy system and, and then just replace it with renewables. That would be an energy transition. But unless but it, you wouldn't have changed anything in society. We could live the same way we always live, produce and consume the same way. It would still be a transition. Mm -hmm. But few observers would call that a transformation mm -hmm. towards sustainability. That requires something more, more profound changes in society. Mm -hmm. And we look, if we look at historically how societies have changed, but it has been more profound change. That can be over a long period of time that these transformations take place. But they involve technology as as uh, Nikel started, right? yeah. So because it's hard to think of at least a positive transformation that has not involved uh, technology, but it's also hard to think of a major societal transformation that has only involved a technological change, because they usually entail uh, political changes, economic changes in the way that we do economy or organize the economy, uh, social changes and, and cultural changes, and even environmental changes. So that's much more profound and. Frequently in the in the literature, you see the the use of the metaphor of the uh, of the the butterfly metaphor, right? From from larvae to to put over, over to to the full fledged a butterfly that's sort of changing in form. It uh, evolves to something different. Mm -hmm. But and we so that captures the transformation part of it, mm -hmm. uh, whereas transition then is not doesn't have the same societal vibe implications usually and as i said i've seen this distinction being made more and more frequently and i think it's helpful mm -hmm. oh, excellent and um i mean you, you also be, um, began with saying that you know the the, the term transformation is used in, in many, many different contexts in your opinion do you think it's it's a buzzword is it something we need how do you how do you stand to the usage of, of transformations in, in this day and age i think that, that that's uh, also Another great question, because I think it, it's important to, to also have a critical eye on the usage of this concept. Mm -hmm. Always when uh, a concept uh, is starting to pick up and start to be used a lot in, in policy circles, there is a tendency, there is a vastness to them, right? Mm -hmm. Because we use them to indicate a position and so on. And, and conversations like these are so helpful and, and, and we really need them to fill the, these concepts with with, with meaning and, mm -hmm. and to make them more precise because that, that, we need that in decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but of course there is this risk that like with sustainable development, if you if you don't specify what you mean with it, it becomes a, a buzzword. Mm -hmm. But that said, I, mean, <laughs> I think the jury's still out if this is the way to go. But we we can say that incremental change in, within the present system has not delivered the 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 decarbonization we need, the biodiversity action we need, and, and the other sustainable development goals, mm -hmm. clearly. And that's I think that's why this concept started to evolve, especially during in the lead up to the 2030 agenda, where the decision was taken in the General Assembly 2015. And, and after that, we've seen an increased interest mm -hmm. because we see that the, what we tried before hasn't delivered. 
-hmm. lot of fine declarations, a lot of fine words, and, and seemingly good policies, but we don't deliver the action. So this is a way to see, can we think anew how, how we organize things in society? Mm -hmm. So in that way, I think it's a necessary concept. I think it's really good, mm -hmm. but we haven't seen that on, on a global scale that we succeed with such transformations. Mm -hmm. Because we need to be humble. I mean, how can we govern societies? Com societies are inherently complex systems, right? They can be influenced by so many things, ongoing transformation, globalization, uh, the, the ongoing environmental changes we have. There's so many things that that uh, is really influence whether we succeed with our transformational policies. Mm -hmm. And then we have different texts, <laughs> different goals with them, and different policies around the world, and different yeah. cultural contexts, and so on. Yeah. So it, it, it's a, it's a historically unique thing that we are, or, or endeavor that we, we embark on. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to be humble also, I think, to mm -hmm. say that, yes, we don't know. It's good that we try this because mm -hmm. we tried the other <laughs> within the present system. Yeah. Now we talk about systems transformation. Let's try that, mm -hmm. but also be, be very humble. Be humble, yeah. So, so show a balanced view of, of, mm -hmm. of the things. Yeah, I mean, this is also one of our main objectives under Edson, right? So we want to... We want to invigorate this debate. We want to keep the discussion alive and, and make sure that we, we have an ongoing conversation about it, you know, so it doesn't turn into buzzwords, but actually, you know, carries the, the meaning behind it when we when we use it in our in our um, strategies and, and communication. Um, but something also you alluded to towards the end. So uh, in your book, you mentioned a, a few different examples of transformations, right? Because as, as, as we understand from, from what you write, Transformation can mean something different in, a, in an absolutely different context. So could you maybe elaborate on, on what are these differences and maybe name one or two examples of uh, context? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if we start with, with, with the obvious, uh, sometimes we talk about systems on a, on, a, on a smaller scale, like it could be the transformation of the energy system or the agriculture system or a, a, of a specific city or whatever. So we see examples and, and policies tried out there. But then we take the 2030 agenda approach, and what a lot of research are calling on is more of our, on a sort of planetary scale transformation, which is a whole different, mm -hmm. another ball game, right? Yeah. So, so much, yeah. yeah. And then we have sort of the, the time perspectives, because mm -hmm. in our, when we did the research, it was clear that when we talked with, with people in one show in China, for instance, they, they said 10 years, that's, that's a long time. I mean, 10 years, the, their whole lives have cha radically changed. Uh, in 10 years, so 10 years was, was a long time frame for them. Mm. But in other, when, like we were talking in Fiji and so on, in, in the local communities, mm. uh, 100, a 100 year perspective was, was reasonable. Mm -hmm. Also, many of the analogies we, we see that the World Economic Forum and others use, it's also make the analogies with the Industrial Revolution or Agricultural Revolution. That, Developments that have taken a very long time. So mm -hmm. that's obvious that we see a lot of where exactly is it a local or, mm -hmm. or, a, or a planetary transformation? What time frame do we have? But then also what what's seen as the major drivers of transformation. What I think is is, is common in all the narratives that were, that we see were used in different in the different contexts was that transformation was more framed as a process rather than a goal. So mm -hmm. I think that's an interesting insight. But how to drive that process, there we could see a lot of differences. And for instance, in, in Sweden, where I'm from, there's a lot of focus on technology. Technology, and if you would talk to people about what do, what do you see as a, as a transformation towards decarbonization, I would say, yeah, new technologies that like, disrupt uh, the way we, we engage uh, with yeah. each other. Or, AI or something. AI, else, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Cabo Verde and, and uh, and video, of course, technology was also important, but they much more emphasized the role of education because we are vulnerable communities. We constantly are exposed to transformation in the world economy, in, in processes around us. So we need education to be able to maneuver in, in a rapidly changing world. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what we've done all along. This is not something new, but then global climate change speeds things up, what mm -hmm. you have to respond to. Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas when when I looked at the, these policies in Sweden, for instance, mm -hmm. and when the government announces sort of what is Swedish word for, for transformative uh, policies, uh, because not all languages have actually a transformation, transformation, mm -hmm. uh, they uh, education is nowhere to be found. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a blind spot. It's not it's not what you associate with transformation. I think that's 
So that is clear differences of course mm -hmm. in how we see how these processes can be, be taken forward. Mm -hmm. And then you always have to adapt to, to these. I mean, keep them keeping in mind um, constantly. Yeah. yeah. And learn from each other. And learn from each other. Exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. Share the share the knowledge. And the one thing that you also point out to that I think is, you know, it's 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 logical when you think about it, but maybe something that people are not so um, conscious about is that there's also such thing as negative transformations, mm -hmm. right? So maybe you could elaborate a little bit on on, on that aspect as well. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Well, an obvious negative transformation is global environment. It changed, which might be positive for for some. The the winter wheat production in 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 Russia is, is expected to win that. So of course that that benefit, but most uh, most countries, especially the vulnerable ones, uh, mm -hmm. will, will suffer. So that's an obvious transformation that, that has negative uh, implications. But we can also see that a lot of these policies that, that are developed then to respond to, to try to spur mm -hmm. a transformation towards decarbonization or other sustainability goals create other winners and losers. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can see clearly see mm -hmm. that the energy transformations, for instance, have happened. Have People can be out of jobs. There's something like in Germany, you have the, so the whole rural uh, area where the coal transformation is in, in, in South Africa now and in Poland and, and many countries. That, that people feel that they, they not only feel that they, they lose out in their sort of security the, mm -hmm. for their everyday life or what they used to or what they see as a culture. Mm -hmm. That's another example. And I think that's why there's so much focus now on just transformation. You can see the research literature just exploding, but also that you see that these, this concept is taken up in international policy making quite a lot. And the mm -hmm. EU has launched its uh, just transformation collaboration with, with South Africa and, and some other countries. And, and you see, yeah, and I think that that's very good because that's a realization that societal transformation, they do create winners and losers mm -hmm. and, and what might be positive for me might have negative consequences. Might have, me, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately. So. I mean, that's also an interesting point that we've also tried to pick up under under Etin, right? So we also talk about directionality of, of, of transformation policies. So to make sure that um, you have you have specific goals and specific outcomes that you want to want to achieve. But also, you know, also looking at the, the holistic aspect of it, right? So, um, what we what we always mention is that it's a, it's, it's also a cross sectoral, a cross boundary kind of initiative where you have to make sure that not only one part is is developing quick, but all the others are able to also, you know, catch up and and complement each other. So, um, again, a very a very important point that that we're trying to trying to pick up in the network. Um, and then maybe moving on to, to also a, a very interesting aspect is where you mentioned um, that there are different narratives of, of transformation. So essentially, you know how how you can how you can present it. So maybe you could um, explain by example one or two two narratives and perhaps you know what what implications this has on our use of, of the word and how we use it. Well, I think it's super interesting to see when, when we did our analysis how there are certain narratives that really are used to to make sense. That's how we come when we try to make sense, especially of new phenomena. We usually we often use metaphors, right? So metaphors is taking sort of the meaning from one area and apply it to another because there is perhaps not a language to explain this new phenomena. So that, that's the, that's the beauty of metaphors. Right? Mm -hmm. Narratives have a similar function, right? They, they they outline a story of how things are connected, a chain of events. Uh, we can think about all the stories we have, Lord of Rings or whatever, the <laughs> narratives so, uh, uh, that, that goes along a certain line that, that make us understand, okay, this is the process, these uh, are the important actors, these are the end goals. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a function of narratives, and, and we use them all the time, so it's interesting from a researcher, it's always interesting to see, okay, how are they used, and, what did, and what's interesting in for us when we, when we did the study is that we saw that as basic five narratives. And they are all interchangeably used because we need different narratives because this is such a grand project mm -hmm. that we're embarking on that we need different narratives to make sense. And two contrasting ones that would be, uh, as you said, the co-creation narrative. That a lot of the language is that we need to, to co-create this. We need to do this together. This is in tandem and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there is another narrative that is often used and that is the, the war metaphors. Uh, we have to behave in a fight, and this is a, a struggle we need to win. Combat, and, climate yeah, change. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. combat, climate change yeah, is an obvious yeah. one, yes. Uh, and and the, they all uh, fulfill different functions. I'm not saying that one is right and one is wrong, but they also have implications that 
that we need to think about, especially the war metaphor. What does that do? Because that often invokes a language also that it is an emergency policy. And now we need to put sort of implicit democracy on a hold because now we need uh, radical actions right now, which uh, in a way it's true. It's, 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 it is urgent. We need to have urgent actions. But of course, if we if we embark on having these sort of uh, uh, policies that, that put other processes aside and, and very fast decisions, that might that approach might collide with something that is often emphasized in, in the transformative governance literature, perhaps even more. We have two, two different approaches. Another revolutionary one, we need to have quick one big bang policies that, mm -hmm. that have an impact now. But more and more in the literature, it's emphasized, well, maybe we need rather experimentations because we need to be agile. This is this is such a grand thing. We don't know what works. We don't know the consequences because this is not society transformation, not only in Switzerland or, mm. or Germany or in Nigeria or Fiji, but all over the world. And, and do we really know what we're doing? Because our so as we said, this is inherently complex mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. So this experimentation, seeing what works and sort of the, the slow race approach mm -hmm. to watch a, a transformation, that approach might collide with the, the war narratives. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why we think it's interesting to look at the narratives. Absolutely. I'm happy to talk much. <laughs> yes, <laughs> unfortunately, we don't have that much time today. And um, you actually also mentioned a little bit of the of, of another question that perhaps we won't go into now, um, we'll, we'll, we'll go in a different direction, but you talked about a little bit about how to govern transformations, right? So this, um, what kind of methods more rather than this incremental experiment, see what works, what doesn't, and then, you know, move forward rather than this more solid sort of long-term plan. But I'll, I'll, I'll leave that aside for now, maybe if we if we have time in the, in the Q&A section. But um, we wanted to uh, use this opportunity since you're here, um, we want to get to know a little bit about your inspiration, your your you know the process of the research. So maybe um, one one question I would have is what what struck you um, the most while writing this book? What what insight was the most surprising, perhaps, to you? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's what I already mentioned that the education featured so, mm -hmm. so strongly. I think that 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 struck me. Mm -hmm. But but another thing that that I wasn't aware of. Maybe I should have been. Uh, because I, I come from economic history and, and I shouldn't have been aware of this, but it was that when we examined all the national determined contributions at that point, it was the intended national contribution when we wrote the book in 2019, and also the submitted monetary national reviews to the Sustainable Development Goals, that it was striking that many countries in, in low and middle income countries mm -hmm. had engaged with the concept of transformation, societal transformation, in their economic plans, in, in their plans on how to develop the, the, the countries, even before sort of they, they had to submit their uh, national determined contribution, going mm -hmm. way back to the 1990s, uh, the Gambia, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, that who clearly had this, and they referred to these reports from the 90s in their nationally determined contributions to, to the Paris Agreement, whereas uh, the, the, the more, the high income countries had not mm -hmm. had that uh, in their policy making at all to the same extent. This was more of a new concept to bring into policy mm -hmm. for, for these countries. I, that, that was striking. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, well, happening a little bit more more recently with all these uh, the new conventions and so on. Yeah. So very interesting. And, and, and also, you, you published this book in 2019, right? So, I mean, nowadays things change fast. We're having. <laughs> feels one crisis after the, after another. So, you know, we, we live in, in, in very volatile times, but um, based on this, and given that it's already been, you know, four years since, since this book was released, is there anything you would add, or maybe are there any unforeseen or foreseen developments that, that, that you would pinpoint here um, since 2019? Yeah, that's a, that's a drawback of writing a book, <laughs> especially in an area like this. I wouldn't say it's obsolete, but, but of course, it, it, I would love to have a second edition of this year. But yes, because the, the research area has exploded, the policy uh, experiments and, and sort of the, how policy spec engages with the concept, it has exploded since then. So if we would write it today, we would have a fantastic palette. 
I don't think actually we could we, we would have another approach, I think, because we couldn't probably cover everything mm -hmm. today, I would I would assume. Mm -hmm. uh, but also there is a lot of them, I think it's a lot more examples of where, where uh, companies, kind of countries, cities, regions are trying to now to see how can we actually spur transformation. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of more concrete examples mm -hmm. to, to analyze, but also to exemplify with today. Mm -hmm. So that I would definitely love to write a chapter. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like, you know, there, there's a need for volume two. So um, maybe use this as a as a hope. <laughs> that there will be... <laughs> we can give them a call. <laughs> we'll send them a video of this. <laughs> um, yeah, so maybe just to, to finish off my part and then I'll, I'll hand over to um, to the participants. Uh, but what what is the main message you would like readers to take away from from your book? that I think this is an, uh, we live in disruptive times. Mm -hmm. So just this thinking about transformations, I think it's a fantastic opportunity to reinvigorate discussions on what societies do we want to, mm -hmm. what, how do we want to, to live together in, 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 in the society, in our everyday life, in the country where we live, but also internationally. I think this, this is truly a, a, a moment where we can use the transformational discussions to, to have this discussion on, what do we want? And that create, I think that unleashes a creativity mm -hmm. in society and, mm -hmm. and, and maybe also hope uh, for those many who need it today mm -hmm. that there is something going on in how we change our, our worldviews and, and what we value mm -hmm. from societies. Mm -hmm. and, and because that's what's happened all, always in transformations. We, we reorient ourselves and transformations often happen or, or are, are sort of spurred in times of crisis, they are it, they are disruptive moments. So we can say there could be a war, a, a pandemic, or a new technologies and so on. But they they do create new opportunities where the things that things how we have done things previously, where we just we can't take that for granted anymore. Mm -hmm. We need to rethink, and then usually things happen that might be hard in the beginning, and that might be be sort of anxiety or mm -hmm. resistance. But in the end, that unleashes something of human creativity, which is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's very inspiring, and we're, we're very happy to have you in our network to be able to continue to contribute to this discussion and, and, and lead on it further on. Um, but now I'd like to turn on a uh, turn over to our to our participants and I will quickly check the chat if we have any. We have a hand raised by Shell Hakan. Yes, Shell Hakan, please go ahead. Thank you. Do you hear me? We hear you and see you. OK, fine. Thanks for a really interesting uh, discussion of the uh, dialogue. My name is Jello Kanerfeld. I, I work at uh, uh, Vinova. One thing that, and I, I agree with you, the, the power of words in the mind, you know, it forms your, your mind and the way you think. So uh, looking into these concepts is really uh, important. But I would like to bring in this. We talked about now transition and transformation, but what we have been discussing in Etting is transformative innovation, the, the combination of, of those. And, and, uh, and uh, innovation is about new novel and, and, and va useful value creation. Creation then that transforms societies and markets. And I, I know we see, I see uh, Anders here in, 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 in the audience. He has been writing a great paper because we, we have had innovation that has been contributing to a transformation since history's beginning, so so that's that's okay. nothing new, but the new thing is is the intention of policymakers and people like me sitting in in an innovation agency to use innovation to drive transformation. And and nowadays okay. at Vinova we have uh, like stopped using transformative innovation, and we talk more about system innovation. You know, having value creation, collective value creation on a system level. Of course, you have to define the system then if it's the society or parts of the market or whatever. But it's really a driving, intentionally driving behavior of people changing, uh, transforming societies and markets through innovation. And that's something much more than you have been discussing right now. So I would like to you to comment on, on this kind of so, uh, system innovation that drives intentional system innovation that drives transformation of societies and 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 uh, uh, or and markets because that's something else. 
Yeah, or related. Yeah, I, uh, I agree. So uh, I think I alluded to that. I think it's hard to think about at least uh, society transformation on grand scale that it has towards positive ends that has not been, been driven that or what technology innovation has not been part of it. But I think the difference is, as you pointed out, that might not have been the technology development might not have been uh, targeting specific political process or political goals, which we now are with the sustainability transformation that's clearly a political uh, arena. Uh, but I think definitely, I think that is what I would uh, categorize as part of uh, sort of the experiments to see how, what would work, how can we spur this? And we know that technology development, of course, are important, but sometimes they can be counteractive or might not have the effect that, that we want. There are plenty of such examples. And, and I think that's that's where the interaction between what you do and to see, okay, so what, how, in what culture can this come in? What, in what social context? How does, does the technology innovation relate to social innovation? So th to have that perspective while we try to, to spur technology innovations, we need to see what, in what context will this fit? And I think it's perfect then to, to illustrate with all the AI technologies that we now are, are seeing emerging and many of them are at least on, on paper are, are developed to specifically contribute to the 2030 agenda and that's a lot of focus on our, how the, the new different AI technologies could contribute to that but of course they won't do it out of context because we know this there will be geopolitical uh, aspects of this that that might be counterproductive and so on so so to have this sort of see how it fits in the society transformation discourse uh, that's what I sometimes miss in these different experiments. I don't know if I've answered your question at all, actually. It's just yeah, more of a reflection. reflected. <laughs> May, may I just uh, add before I say Lena is, is wanted to make a contribution also, but I think one of the challenges, and I'm working quite a lot now with the, the European Innovation Agenda around deep tech, and, and and usually when you do this disruptive innovation, in my view, you, you have to change an ecosystem. You do ecosystem innovation. And, and, and then you come into this, how can you have a collective value creation, not focusing on each, you know, it's not about technology, so it's about value creation. So how do you create a collective value creation among a, a group of stakeholders that collectively work towards a common value creation, which is novel and useful for the society? And we we are, it's still a rhetoric thing, and we are struggling to find ways of doing this in reality. That's, that's in my view, the challenge, at least I'm working daily on uh, uh, in trying to find ways of doing that. And that's super interesting. I, I, I love to learn more. I'm glad I'm part of this network. Because I think, I mean, it's big, what, what has happened in the last few years, and then so much more insight also to the complexity, but also so many brilliant minds that are trying to figure out how we will do this. I think that's, but I like this approach, the system innovation approach. I think that's, that's a good time. So I'll be happy to learn more. Great starting point for further discussions. Thank you so much, Jill. <laughs> um, I see we also have um, Lena who raised her hand. Please go uh, ahead. Yes, uh, my name is Lina Svensberg. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm from the Compare Foundation also in Sweden, and I'm uh, unreasonably interested in uh, semantics around innovation, especially right now the um, uh, similarities and differences between system innovation and transformative innovation. And I just want to test the thought on you and hear, hear what you think that I would say that um, transformative innovation do has a bit of a scale implication to it, right? It has to transform the society in somehow. And I'm wondering if the system innovation rather could be seen as an approach to innovation rather than uh, implying that kind of scale. I mean, a system is, I mean, if you want to address a system, you want to get a different result and you thereby address the, the purpose or the interconnections, the rules, so to say, or the culture in order to change the behavior and thereby get a different result. That is very possible to do, to experiment with in small scale, meaning it's an approach to innovation that doesn't apply the, uh, the where the size of the system that you're innovating isn't isn't critical. The, the, the approach is the critical thing. And that system innovation thereby could lead to transformation if you scale it up, so to say. What would, what would you say about that 
uh, interpretation? It, or do you see that this system innovation by nature needs to be big at scale? And what would we then call this approach when you experiment with purpose, interconnections, etc., system demonstrators, etc.? Do you understand the question? Yeah, yeah, I, I understand. I think it, it's. A... I would say, oh, well, yeah, I agree completely, except <laughs> with the word of system, because I think that's quite complicated, because I, I think I, I would agree with you with that definition of system. But what we can also see also in our data, that, that what you see as a system that varies so, so much. It's, it's, it can be also systems can be on a smaller scale and it can be on, on, a, sort of, on a global scale. And if you look at the the um, that uh, the uh, global stock take, uh, you know, the in before the uh, in the kind of negotiations that part of the Paris Agreement is that after uh, every five years that would be a global stock take on the national carbon contributions for what countries have promised to do for the Paris Agreement. And that first stock take, the, the, the synthesis, uh, technical synthesis report was just released a month ago sort of to start the discussion because this will be a key topic in, in, in Dubai in in a few weeks at the climate negotiations. And that that report talked a lot about system transformations and the need for system transformation. And I think that is systems on a more grander scale than this experiment focus. So there's just the concept of system because system can be yeah a lot. But I like the the if we can just be clear on what we, what, what kind of system we talk about, I, I, I would I'd completely agree with you. Yeah, I think I think that is an is an interesting uh, point that just the definition of system is quite is quite crucial. And if the, if there exists small system, you could also in theory do small system innovation. But of course, as all innovation, it doesn't really it goes from invention to innovation when it when it scales. So maybe we should start talking about system inventions if we do it small scale before it spreads. Um, Thanks, thanks, Lina. I think uh, Chris in the room with us wanted to yeah, ask a question. Question in terms of um, the policy tools. So I was thinking specifically about regulators and what role they would have. Because put tax to one side for a minute, it's another policy tool. But um, specifically, how regulation needs to change in order to drive or support transformative mm -hmm. uh, innovation for, for the SDGs. Um, because it's something where it's often seen as an old fashioned kind of um, tool, but I wonder if, if kind of you know, smarter regulation could be a, a really good way forward on, on these trans transformations. Yes, and now I'm out of my comfort zone. So I've been since you started the question. <laughs> but, but yeah, so, so the, but regulations tend to be, be conservative, right? Yeah, that would be my hunch. Yeah, yeah. So that they would tend to conserve the system. But of course, when we, I mean, when we talk about, for instance, innovation transformations, so what, of course, we don't want any transformation. We want it in a particular way yeah, to the yeah, sustainable no. goals. And then we need regulations to make sure that, that whatever we now are, but new approaches, new changes, or new tools that, that comes to us, either through technological or social innovations or cultural change or social new social preferences or new political ways to do things or yeah, economic models. We need to regulate that so the the, so yeah. the, the negative consequences which we talked about are, are kept in order. So so we can't abandon regulations, but so there could be a tool if yeah, we can get I away mean, from this. Sort of I'm like, thinking that as like say the electric vehicle mm -hmm. revolution that's still kind of to fully take shape. And it's like unless you had regulations about air quality and unless you had mm -hmm regulations about the standards of the plugs that you put in, you know, so they're interoperable between mm -hmm. the brands, you couldn't have that revolution really. So we're pushing yeah. for that revolution. I mean, it could be that we're pushing for the wrong revolution. It could be mm -hmm. there's a different way of doing this and maybe mm -hmm. the regulators are pushing us, mm -hmm. maybe lithium batteries are not the yeah. only way of doing this. That's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, so it's a, but it really is shaping the market at the moment and it's shaping all the innovations mm -hmm. and the whole innovation ecosystem. Yeah. Um, and it's all based on um, sort of a notion driven by policymakers still. So it is still quite conservative. Um, but that, that's an interesting example because the car make manufacturers in California now, uh, 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 sort of the, the, the regulations on car make that, that uh, California introduced in the 80s, of course, that, that was regulations that really 
draw at least partly a, a transformation of, of, of yeah. the country. And, and what we have now with the EU directive, of course, that's also uh, we're facing facing up, but not not yeah. not forbidding them. But the regulations will tighten up, so they will be in essence uh, impossible to have uh, any fossil fuel car <laughs> driven yeah. cars by 2035. And now I, I just. Today, I saw a report that that's one of the few trends that actually are in line with the Paris Agreement, the introduction of electric vehicles. That's that's about the only one that that is in, in line with the expectations from the Paris Agreement. And the EU, a lot of its um, horizon now is around grand challenges. But it just makes me wonder, are, are there grand challenges we're missing out? You know, um, but there will for sure be new things that emerge, but, mm -hmm. you know, how do we help them to emerge? And I guess that's more the grassroots kind of sandbox approach. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a difficult, difficult one for, because policymakers are not, they're not, well, they're definitely not all seeing um, and how can they support more, you know, all of these kind of ideas people, you know, so but I don't know the answer I was just done. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, that, that's what... Very good response. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think we have um, time for, for one, maybe two more questions. So if there's anyone else who would like to, to ask a question, I think Hiel, you had your hand up. Was that an old yeah, hand I was, or? Yeah, I was thinking about, this is a topic might uh, require another session, but Lena brought up this about how do we, well, how do we go about uh, doing it, the approach we should use. And and I was wondering if, if you have any comments on, because if, if we understand that these are complex adaptive system, they have uh, emergent properties and, and our traditional analytical engineering oriented divide by conquer approaches does not work when you have emergent properties and, and this kind of experimental and scaling becomes very difficult and uh, difficult to understand due to the emergent properties of a complex system. So if any any comments on, on, on how we need to change approaches when we enter uh, and understand that we are dealing with complex adaptive systems? Yeah, well, my immediate association in a way, and I, I think this requires a, a lot of sessions, I guess, but my immediate reflection just was that what we've seen previously when societies changed profoundly, like with the Industrial Revolution, we saw the development of new new fields of, of knowledge, sort of like sociology, for instance, really grew out of a way to understand, but also to provide tools to maneuver in, 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 in the rapid changes that, that uh, the Industrial Revolution and Dante brought on. And I think similarly today, we can see how the academic system, at least, tried to respond through transdisciplinary approaches and so on. Uh, and I've seen increasing interest in sort of strategic foresighting, which is a buzzword I know among companies and tech uh, people, but it really has had, in my view at least, not so much methodological development. As, uh, but now I can see a lot of interest to see work with the new technologies like AI and so on in strategic foresighting, but in coming in with competences from a lot of areas, bringing them together, like a transdisciplinary exercise in strategic foresighting. That is something that I, I think would be super interesting to see how we can do that with better quality. Even though complex system doesn't, you don't, yeah. can you cannot predict outcomes? <laughs> no, so, but foresighting is not about prediction, right? It is, it's it about, it's about being prepared for different uh, yeah. pathways, different scenarios. But this, this is, uh, I, mean, I, I just have to jump in myself. I think this is really interesting because we're coming to this, I mean, innovation per se uh, is, uh, is going into uncertainty. We don't know. And if we knew where we were going, it wouldn't be innovation. So that's the whole point. At the same time, we have to deal with it. And what, uh, and I, I picked up several things here uh, from, from when I was listening. You said, mentioned this educational aspect. Uh, it's all about learning. Uh, as we do it. So um, when I hear it, it actually becomes a segue to what is what is going to be our next event where you actually want to participate. The whole question of learning. We are experimentation or uh, experiment uh, experimenting. We need to experiment. But at the same time, if we knew where we were going, it wouldn't be a, a point in doing it. So we have to deal with this 
now you have been looking back and learned about so what is what is that's why we invited you and sort of that that what how have transitions happened up to now when we weren't doing it in a deliberate way so what can we bring in when we add what shell hokan was saying uh, 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 an ambition a, a really um um and, and, and the directionality and an intent uh, and to what extent can then innovation that is per se then something we don't know where we're going be combined in a learning process i think that is, is going to be key i'm happy that you are going to participate and i'm also in uh, uh, the rest of you i hope there were several that are, are online Jean who's going to be there so next week we, we're going to discuss that i think that the 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 the, the, the discussion on how to organize ourselves for a learning, as we do, is a, is a critical aspect. Uh, and Shell raised, uh, Shell Okan raised uh, lots of questions here. I also think that is, uh, if I were to make my personal comment on what I think your contribution is, because we deliberately now separated innovation mm -hmm. from the discussion of transformation, because we have to know, is transformation a uniform thing? No, it's not, mm -hmm. it's really not. Mm -hmm. And that has implications for every reason that you gave here with PG and education. It means that how we use innovation in different contexts to stimulate the transformation will be different. Mm -hmm. And we have to sort of map that out. What, what kind of transformation are we one looking for? And how is that perceived of in the context in which we are operating? Because the policy measures that we take the kind of innovation that we have to pursue will differ. Mm -hmm. It will. And that's that's a that's a, a, a fantastic topic for conversation that I think mm -hmm. you know your second book could be linking into what we're doing. That would be really I, interesting. Yeah. And now going into learning, then we are uh, uh, then uh, learning as a process, then we're really uh, then we really on to something. So with that said, um, I mean we're kind of rounding off here. And let me then say that uh, from from the network point of view, we are having this um, session at the team of specialists uh, on, on innovation and competitive policies in Geneva next week. Some of you are going to participate. For those who are not able to be here on site and are interested, you can actually uh, participate online first in, in the discussions as such. There will be very passive sort of observing Whereas we also are planning for Etin uh, a, a full work stream with lots of activities moving forward of the next nine to 12 months on exactly learning. So that would be the starting point. And we're going to plan that in a, in a session directly after uh, the official event here in Geneva next Thursday in the afternoon. And there you can actually participate and contribute. So I hope you will, will join us there. What we also going to do, and now I turn to the to this uh, this uh, event that we've had now, the, the live podcast. As I said, we're going to have every second Wednesday, and we're actually going to do the next one will be the week after Plus ICP. So what we're going to do in in the spirit of being agile and picking up things as they evolve, etc., is that we're going to have um, uh, and reflection, not the least, is we're going to have our next converse, live podcast on learning, picking up on what we now talked about at TOS ICP. So, you know, we're going to have actually uh, every week things here, but what, who's going to, I will be moderating that session. Uh, who the guests are, that remains to be seen. That's going to be a <laughs> secret because we're actually going to try to grab people on site and have them participating. So we're probably not going to have one uh, guest, but two or three. And we talk about what this generate, what TOS ICP generated a week in hindsight, and how we can move forward on that collectively in the network through our respective activities. Then to finalize, what we're going to do on the on the la on this last um, uh, live podcast before Christmas, which actually is going to take place on Lucia, the 13th. So there's going to be ginger cookies and it's going to be Swedish Geliva and Gilevi and all that stuff here and a little bit Santa Claus music, perhaps, who knows? Maybe and, we'll sing a, the same Well, I can, I <laughs> think I can sing my singing <laughs> somewhere else, perhaps. But uh, then we're going to turn to a, 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 another topic, which is going to be fossil-free steel. 
And then we're going to have our director, uh, Elizabeth Tuch, being the moderator. And the guest is going to be uh, Jöran Nyström from Ovaco. Uh, and they, they are working with Fossil Free Steel with the topic of sort of the insight being here. How do you transform an entire industry? What are the challenges and opportunities in transforming an industry? He is a part of, a, of, of an initiative where you... I mean, Sweden and other countries are doing a lot on hydrogen, where hydrogen comes in as an energy source. They are even going into biofuels. I, I promise this is an extremely interesting topic as such. It's going to be perhaps more, you know, the doing thing. Now we've been quite conceptual, but it's going to be very much on doing how you, an, in, an, an industry inside perspectives. So I think we have a pretty interesting agenda up to New Year's. And we have ideas about after New Year, but please give us also uh, your suggestions, your ideas. If you are even willing to, to moderate something, let us know. This is what the network is for. So thanks for that. And then. Yeah, and with that, we'll, we'll make sure to send you uh, relevant information on, on everything that, that Mika just mentioned. But we would like to finish off with our last element of this live podcast, yes. um, namely a game yes. called um, Two Truths and One Lie. For that, I would kindly ask Olivia to uh, portray the slide that we have prepared. And uh, for those of you that don't know this game, um, so here are three statements that uh, Bjorn Ola has provided us with, and two of them are true and one of them is false. So um, we would like to ask you to, to indicate which of these statements do you believe is false? Yes. So get to know the man. This <laughs> exactly. is the man behind the book. <laughs> and uh, I will now, if I'm not uh, completely wrong, send out this one. And you should uh, uh, be what statement is false again. So I'll just read them out while we're while we're waiting for everyone to vote. So the first one is I have been knocked over by a hunchback whale. The second one, I have been detained by the KGB. And the third, I have a 14 year old older brother that I got eight years ago. So I will, the polls are coming in. This is okay. Interesting. Yeah. So um, we have 50%, uh, uh, no, 45% now. Okay. The polls are still coming in. <laughs> We're still. <laughs> this is like Eurovision. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. So I think many have voted. It seems to have stopped changing now. So we've got uh, six votes, 42% for option three, 35% uh, so five votes for option two, and 21% so three votes for option one. So option three was guests most likely to be false. Maybe you'd like to reveal. <laughs> well, the one that is false is that I was not uh, knocked over by a hunchback way. Just almost. It appeared like five minutes, seven meters from, from where I was kayaking in Monterey Bay. So I thought I was going to trip over, but it didn't happen. But it's a fantastic experience. <laughs> so that's why I wanted to hear. The that? others are uh, true. Yeah. You detained by the well, yes. In my, my youth, I was uh, oh my participated in in smuggling Bibles to the Soviet Union. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> and then I will, because I grew up in the church. I moved yeah. there. And then I took photo. They asked me to take photos of some documents, and I was too young to realize this was stupid. Mm -hmm. So the KGB searched me all over, but they. They were on the film that they <laughs> just took out. This it was in the olden days when you just took out the film. So, but, yeah. What an experience. Yeah, yes. <laughs> what an experience. Okay, well, I mean, I think that's, that's a great And I got the older brother. And you got the older brother. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we had to share the story over a beer or a coffee. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> More to come. We have... For those of you who are coming in next week, Bionula is obviously then going to participate so we can he can reveal the whole story about his uh, brother uh, and uh, it's a wonderful story uh, <laughs> I, I, to be continued <laughs> but this was fantastic uh, thank you very much yes and uh, hope to see you in two weeks and some of you next week and uh, thanks thank you very much bye bye thank you
Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. bye.